everyone. Um, is this on? People hear it? Cool. Great. So yeah, excited to be talking about some of the work that we're doing at Stitch Fix on both the how and the why of using human intent to improve our recommendation systems. So Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service. So how it works is you fill out a big like style profile to tell us your price preferences, aesthetic, fit, everything about what you like to wear and how you like to wear it. Um, then we use all of that information to uh, uh, recommend what a human stylist should put in a box to send to you. Uh, and so how it works from a user's perspective is that you receive this box of clothes, you keep what you love, you send the rest back. Um, and we are a personal styling service for everybody. So right now we serve women's, men's, and now kids as of a year ago. Um, and we have a big range of sizes too, really inclusive from plus to petite. And we've been in the US for about eight years, but just launched in the UK a couple months ago, which is part of why I'm excited to be here. Um, so how we do personalization at scale, um, it's a really hard problem. And a big part of how we get it done is by combining expert human judgment with the data science and machine learning recommendations. So internally, almost every team across the company consumes recommendations from the data science team as part of doing their daily job. And in order to get this done, we have more than 100 people on the algorithms team in our San Francisco headquarters. So a lot of people are working on some flavor of recommendations. Uh, there's also people working on experimentation and like warehouse and logistics, um, a huge number of different problems. So it's a really fun place to work. Um, and when I talk about recommenders during this talk, I'm going to use a pretty broad definition of what a recommender means. So it's just going to be anything where you, uh, algorithmic recommendation or results are used to guide a human making a decision that has some effect in the real world that people actually care about. So I'm going to go through a couple different examples of recommendation systems that we're working on. One is for the stylists, and their job is to decide what to put in the box to send to an individual client. Um, and the second example I'm going to talk about today is for the buyers. So there's a separate team of people at Stitch Fix whose job it is to decide what we're going to stock in the warehouses. I mean, that's the teams I actually work with, and that's the example that we're going to go through second. So get started by building some fake styling recommenders. So to set the stage a little bit, let's think about how recommendations for merch work in the real world. So we're gonna do a little bit of role play. Um, I'm gonna play myself and have a lovely volunteer from the audience who's gonna play my friend. So suppose I wanna be asking my friend for recommendations about something. I was in the market for a new backpack recently, so what backpack should I get? <laughs> well, I love my old messenger backpack, um, but I'm looking for a regular backpack this time. Well, you like that to come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that it's waterproof, it has good pockets, it fits my laptop. I um, mean, this lasted for a really long time, so I want something sturdy. And it looks pretty cool, too. I'll get a new vest then. <laughs> well, the one that I have fits okay, but I want something that fits even better. Fits pretty important to me. And it would be fun to try a new brand that I haven't had before. Cool. I think you like this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what just happened here? Um, I provided my friend with some of my general preferences. These were things that were true about my preferences in the past that are also true in the present and in the future. Um, I also provided some specific preferences that hadn't been true in the past. So things that um, if my friend didn't know this for some reason, they wouldn't have been able to guess it necessarily. Um, I also provided some explicit pieces of information, things that were fairly objective, that if you were building some kind of tagging system, these would probably come up in your tags. Um, but I also provided some more implicit information that you would have to have outside knowledge about me or about the backpack industry or something else in order to infer what the information I was providing actually meant within your system. So. Uh, how do some standard recommender systems incorporate these different kinds of information? So in collaborative filtering, um, the standard across the industry, Amazon, a huge number of other places use different flavors of this. Uh, this is the people who bought this also bought kind of recommender system. So at Stitch Fix, this would look like a matrix where you have clients along the rows 
uh, pieces of merch along the columns, and what if they bought it before a zero if they hadn't? And you run this through your favorite matrix factorization and you get recommendations. Uh, this is entirely based on general information about their past behavior. Um, and it's also entirely based on implicit information. Uh, so when uh, someone has bought an item in the past, they didn't buy that item with the intent of training your algorithm better. They bought it because they wanted to have it. And so all of this implicit information may or may not be relevant to the specific situation that you're working on. And this causes a lot of problems when people's preferences are changing over time. <laughs> and so there was this fun like hacker news thread uh, where people were complaining about all the different situations in which Amazon is giving, like they search for a vacuum once and Amazon never stops showing them vacuums. Like they don't want that anymore. Um, so we care about doing better than this at such fix. So say we want to start incorporating some explicit information, uh, for instance, like uh, profile questions. So content-based recommenders is one way to do this. And so uh, at Stitchfix, this might look like uh, this user has said they like preppy clothes, they like goth clothes, and they like green. And then you could get those same labels for all of our items of merch and compute some distance metric between the user and the items and use that to rank the recommendations. Um, this is nice because when the user fills out their profile, they're doing it with the intent of getting recommendations that match the profile question that they're filling out. So it seems like it should be more relevant. But this can cause problems too. Um, this user likes preppy clothes and goth clothes. They want those at the same time. <laughs> at any given time, how do we know which one they want? Um, so preferences can often be incompatible. And if you think about this from the OkCupid okay perspective, this is uh, like OkCupid's okay uh, algorithm also. You can think about your own dating preferences and you probably have preferences for different kinds of partners that might be incompatible in the same person, but you still like those in different people for different reasons. Um, so now, what if we uh, say, okay, we can do better than this, look at literature, see what like a little more niche algorithms are out there, and there's a field of context-aware recommendations. And what that generally means is getting location or time information, things that you can infer from the users, uh, like, yeah, clock or IP address or things like that. Um, throwing those columns into your collaborative filtering algorithm and getting recommendations based on that. So this is like people in your situation also bought these items. This is getting a bit better, um, but it still has the fundamental problem that people like you are kind of boring. <laughs> Any recommendation that is going to be for users like you will, by definition, be for a, a person who is a little bit more average than you are in terms of your preferences. And StitchFix is in the business of enabling self-expression, and so we won't settle for something that is only recommending something that's a little bit more average. So what do we do instead? We just explicitly ask for people's specific preferences. So uh, when someone uh, signs up to receive a box of clothes, they have an opportunity to fill out a free text box. Um, so they might say something like, I love the distressed jeans and the last fix, um, but this time I'd like something totally different. I want an outfit to go to my cousin's wedding. And this is something we never would have guessed looking at their past purchases, um, looking at their profile questions, um, and we have to have pretty invasive like social media permissions in order to guess this. <laughs> So we don't want to go down that road. Um, instead, we just like ask people what they want, and then we give them what they want. And so you can treat this as something like search terms or NLP. Um, and the, the second example we're going to be talking about, it takes the form of something more like configuration parameters. So this has been a, a really great framework for think, us to think about how to design recommendation algorithms. Um, you can use the features that are coming out of this in classical recommender situations or in other kinds of algorithms. Um, you can also think of it through the lens of explore exploit. So all the standard information from uh, collaborative filtering or uh, tags helps you exploit. Um, you already know how to do that. Um, but this uh, specific information is great for guided exploration into new territory that you haven't explored with that user yet. Um, it's also fun from a philosophical standpoint. Um, people grow and change over time, and of course your users are going to want different things in the future than they have in the past. And so it's a fundamentally optimistic algorithmic framework. 
um, and the practice has just led to really good outcomes for us. So when the stylist uh, has the more standard classical recommendations paired with the human readable, human generated text, and they can make really good decisions on behalf of the client. So let's look at the second example now. So the buyers are the people who decide what clothes we're gonna be carrying. And that's the team that I work with. Um, so we have a, a data science team that is specifically tasked with working with this internal team of buyers. So let's go through the example of building a real merch recommendation system. So how the merch team's job worked in the past was that they would uh, get a list of all the merch that was available from all the vendors that we work with. Um, and since they're lucky enough to work at a place like Stitch Fix, each of those items comes with a algorithmically generated performance metric. So we think we know how well it's gonna do in the future. They have this information and they go through these lists and they pick the items off the list that we wanna be carrying again. This in a lot of ways is similar to a standard e-commerce experience and part of the value props of Stitch Fix for the clients is that they don't have to do that standard e-commerce hunting and pecking themselves. So we thought that we could probably do better than this for our internal buyer also. So how the original tool that we built for them worked was they would enter some kind of intent in the form of just a filter. Say, I want to be looking at shirts. Um, that would get sent to the backend API which would pull in the predictions for how well each item of clothing is gonna do with different client segments in the future. Um, that get filtered and sent back to the user. So pretty straightforward. But over time, as we continued to develop this internal tool, uh, the buyers kept asking for all these like additional filters and combinations of filters and knobs and dials and bells and whistles and both sides are getting pretty frustrated with each other about trying to figure out how to uh, combine all of these features into the UX ma that made sense and how to rank, uh, how to be prioritizing building them. And it was just kind of a mess. And so we stepped back and had some uh, deep like user research conversations with the internal team of buyers about like, what problem are we actually trying to solve here? How are we trying to build this assortment of merch? And we ended up realizing something that we probably should have realized from the beginning, which is that they don't care about choosing items off a list. They care about running a business. So in addition to optimizing this performance metric, they uh, care about uh, choosing merch that is diverse across all of the ways in which our clients are diverse, uh, price point, fit, aesthetic, everything else. Um, we're running a profitable business, and so they care about meeting our financial targets. Merchandising is a very seasonal and long lag time process, and so they care about getting seasonally relevant merch in at the right time. And they care about having supply match demands, and so getting exactly the right amount of each item at every time. So we stepped back and thought about all of these from a different <coughs> algorithmic framing. We thought, we're trying to maximize this performance metric subject to all of these constraints let's use constrained optimization instead of a standard recommendation system. So we reformulated this as a problem where our decision variable is the number of units of any item of merch to be stocking. And we choose that in order to maximize the overall predicted performance of the whole collection of merch. Um, subject to all of the constraints that we talked about on the previous slide. Um, and it's taken a fair bit of work to formulate all of these as equality or inequality constraints, but we've pretty much gotten there now. Um, and we solve it with PyOMO, which is an open source um, package that has Python bindings. Uh, it's been working pretty well for us, but the documentation is kind of terrible. So uh, s several teams at Stitch Fix are using PyOMO for optimizations. And one of them, uh, Jeff Schechter, has written a blog post on our blog, uh, multi-threaded that has a much better tutorial than anything else I found on the internet. So if you're curious, I would start there. So to re-architect the system in order to uh, use the constrained optimization framing, and we changed the front end so that instead of uh, 
uh, yeah, now the user who's the buyer enters their strategic intent for what the assortment of merch is going to look like. So things like margin, um, fit, et cetera. That user intent is translated into constraints that the, optimi the optimizer can deal with. Um, and the optimizer combines those constraints with exactly the same predictions that we were working with earlier, finds the optimal solution, and returns it back to the user. And so now they go from um, strategic intent all the way to a full set of recommendations in one single step from their perspective. So this has been working way better. Um, it does have some technical challenges, though. So one is around speed. Uh, we've introduced this uh, real-time uh, um, optimization step, which is likely to be pretty slow. So it was important to make sure that all of the other steps of the pipeline are fast. So on the API side, just standard like uh, caching and other uh, optimizations there can help. Um, and it became extra important for us to be doing our model training and prediction in offline batch ETLs. So we were doing this before, but if we hadn't, we would probably have had to move to doing this in order to enable the new real-time step. There are also a lot of challenges from the UX perspective uh, because this was a completely fundamentally different way of the buyers doing a really important part of their job. So we had to uh, design interfaces that encouraged the buyers to encode their intent in a way that the algorithm was going to understand and educate the buyers about uh, how the algorithm was going to work so that they could do that well. Um, and then when the recommendations were shown back to uh, the buyer, uh, we had to include a lot of context so that they could make good decisions based on those recommendations that were several steps removed from the underlying predictions. And maybe the coolest part is that this new framing uh, enabled buyers to iterate through this cycle many times. So for instance, they could look at this assortment and say like, oh wait, there's no black here. We need to carry something black. And so they could go back to the targets and our new target um, and go through the cycle again and get a completely different set of recommendations out of the same set of uh, predictions. So decoupling the predictions from the recommendations enables this a whole different uh, way of working. After we designed the system, we realized that it's actually parallel to a lot of other systems that are out there. So maps, for instance. Um, so the parallel is that you'd start by entering your intent, in this case, the start and the destination. Um, that would get passed down to the routing engine, which would pull in the predictions of travel times, uh, in this case, uh, and pass it back to the user in the form of a recommended route to take. So cool things about this is that uh, it enables data science to separate the prediction task from the recommendation task. So we were already doing that prediction, but having that separate uh, recommendation task as a, a middle layer here uh, sets up a really nice uh, clear separation of concerns between the people that are working on like batch offline ETLs and the people who are working on uh, real-time online tasks. Um, and so we've actually started to organize some of our teams internally along these uh, divisions. It does have technical challenges though, so if your data science teams are not used to working with uh, raw user input, you're going to have to learn how to do that. Um, and if you don't have uh, task queues or job runner kind of architecture set up, that was pretty important for us to get this working. It's totally worth it from the user's perspective though. So the ability to ask different questions and get different answers out of a recommendation system is totally game changing. And it makes it much more similar to the conversation that we had about the backpack, where like, if I had given different answers or if my friend had asked me different questions, we would have arrived at a very different point for the recommendation. With that great power does come great responsibility for the user though. Um, they have to learn how to have a conversation with an algorithm, which is a pretty hard thing for some users to do. So everything you can do from the UX perspective to encourage that structured thinking really helps. So to wrap up, um, 
by collecting in the moment specific preferences as well as general preferences. Uh, Intent-driven algorithms enable uh, recommendations that change over time as people's preferences change over time. Uh, and by uh, allowing users to explore many different possible scenarios, uh, it enables users to, uh, yeah, deal with situations where they might have two sets of incompatible preferences, but they want to know what the outcome might be if they go down either path. And by stepping outside of a framework where uh, there's just one right answer and allowing many uh, possible answers, it really opens up the space in which users can explore and play and puts the user back in the driver's seat. So instead of algorithms limiting users' options, now users are in control um, and can make decisions on their own behalf without the algorithm uh, getting in the way. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great, thanks very much. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, just put your hand up and I'll come around with the microphone. science can really help certain different types of decision um, and really not. One thing you mentioned casually, I think it's like uh, strikes me as what happens if someone forgets to order black clothes. Do you have anything around uh, anomaly detection? Because that's someone, it's amazing, but it seems like you, there's a big thing you're forgetting, which is not really in your prediction, not really in the intent, but in the difference between them. And do you have a way for people to express the fact, no, I will not order anything black this season because this is an intention, this is an editorial decision. How does that being that the missing part work? Um, see if I can restate that question. And, um, are you asking whether we have a wording for, hey, there's no black here, did you actually want to have some black? <laughs> um, or are you asking whether we are tracking um, whether a user will say, like, no, I want to opt out of this thing that I normally want to put a target for? <coughs> Both, yep. Um, neither at the moment, but those are sort of next set of features that we want to be working on over the next couple quarters because, yeah, I agree that they're incredibly important to making sure that um, the user doesn't have so much control that they get themselves into a corner where the algorithm knows that there could have been a better outcome. Uh, cool talk. Quick question about the Payomo. So there's, there's a couple of these solvers out there, right? I mean, there's yeah. Payomo, you've got Noir Tools. Nowadays, there's the CVX Pi. Is yeah. there any reason in particular why Payomo seems interesting? Could, could you maybe shed some light on why the choice was made? I don't know if you know. But. Yeah, so uh, one reason why we chose Payomo is that it was already getting really good traction with some other teams at Citrix, so it was pretty well proven. Um, the, some of the other teams are using it for uh, integer solver problems, and so it's nice for um, problems with, yeah, a different uh, range like that. CVX Pi is only for convex problems, and we wanted the option of non-convexity here, too. So it sounds like you've got these kind of predictors at the one step that are kind of trained separately, and then you've got the separate optimization problem. Yep. Um, do you think there's any kind of benefit of kind of doing it end-to-end, -end so that you, you know, your, your, your predictors are actually aware that there's some kind of optimization problem going on later on? And maybe that means that they don't have to learn certain things or that maybe there's some other benefit. So I think there are times when that could be a, a helpful way to think about it. One reason where we like to separate it is that we have not just one prediction going into this, but a whole collection of predictions. Um, and there might be different teams across the company that are generating each of those. And so that separation of concerns is worth it for us uh, at this moment. But it's, yeah, definitely something we're going to keep an eye on. So how do you test the accuracy of those systems where you have human interaction and you, humans are also selected in uh, certain mm -hmm. options? Yep, so in the stylist example, oh, you can use the same uh, kind of evaluation metrics as for any other recommendation system. So oh, did the stylist put things in the box that the clients decided to keep um, in the context of this additional information? So that part's exactly the same. Um, in the context of the buyer problem, 
yeah, it's just kind of by definition, like was the result that was returned to the user something that met their initial constraints? So that's just the metric here is whether the constraints were feasible in the first place. And so at that step, it's a, a UX problem of how do you encourage the user to give you feasible constraints. For your customers, how, for your customers, how do you keep track of who is an adventurous shopper who is willing <laughs> to try something new yep. and who wants the same old thing all over again? How do you track the different variability of potential uh, of, of potential suggestions that would be acceptable? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we have a variety of different ways that we track that. So one is on the questionnaire that you fill out at the beginning, um, at least in some versions of it, one of the questions is literally, how adventurous are you? <laughs> um, you can also, yeah, there's other questions like, how often do you want different kinds of clothing, like going out clothes or professional clothes or different things like that. Um, so that's one big thing is just like user telling us. Uh, another is there is a, separate source of data that I haven't talked about yet uh, that's called Style Shuffle, which is kind of like Tinder for clothes, and so we get a lot of uh, like thumbs up, thumbs down ratings, and that's another really powerful source of data that we have for learning both the specificity and the breadth of people's style preferences. Um, I think you mentioned that the the recommender team was 100 plus people. So is it primarily, again, specifically for the customer close recommendation, or mm. is it even ads oriented? Mm. Could you tell us just a bit more about the structure and maybe to put it in perspective, um, is that like 1% of the company or is that 90% <laughs> of the company? Yeah, so the, the algorithms team overall is what I said is uh, more than 100 people now. Um, and that includes people working on the merch recommenders, um, like I am, um, also people working on the styling recommendations, also people working on customer acquisition funnel, um, as well as demand forecasting and logistics and a huge uh, swath of other problems. Um, Thank you so much for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about uh, evaluation of this merge buying recommendation system. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, uh, if uh, you are tracking whether or not the results were returned were the mm -hmm. match for the uh, search um, uh, search that the user gave, uh, mm -hmm. how do you account for the problem that uh, the user might have given the wrong search? So mm -hmm. like they they. Oh, I, I forgot to add like a very special term that we really need to uh, to be having, and then the result that's got returned it might be a good result, it might be a good match for the uh, search that they given, but it's just a, a bad search. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think a couple of these questions are about um, suppose that we actually. Uh, buy the set of merch that was recommended by any one of these iterations. Uh, through the recommender, what are the outcomes going to be for the business at the end of the day? Um, is that part of the question? Um, so in that case, we would want to run uh, experiments on uh, different versions of this and s try to develop the counterfactual of what if we had carried this other set of merch? What would the business outcomes be? Um, and so, yeah, experimentation frameworks like that are the, the ultimate way to test the, um, the value of these algorithms. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, so my question is uh, about the uh, intent-driven algorithms you were talking mm -hmm. about. Um, do you believe that the other approaches, such as content-based or uh, collaborative filtering, um, should generally be replaced by more intent-driven approaches, or is it only suitable for certain sort of domains and, and applications? I think that incorporating user intent matters most when uh, the user is conscious that they're making a choice and has some intent in the first place. Uh, so for instance, for something like uh, news recommendations or social media, if all the user wants to do is really just like keep scrolling, then that's a very different kind of metric to be optimizing for. Um, but in this case, where they're making a decision and they care about the result of that decision, then incorporating everything that 
uh, they have in their head to make the recommendations relevant for them at that moment, I think makes a difference. Question over here, I don't know if it's been answered. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, uh, do, do you have uh, any explicit mechanism in the UI to allow the, the client to, to express some intent of um, if it, he likes or not uh, a product or another type of sentiment? So one thing we have along those lines is after someone receives their box of clothes and is deciding what to keep and what to send back, there is a feedback that we collect at that stage. So uh, someone might say, uh, I loved the fit of this, but the style wasn't good, and so I'm not going to keep it. Or I loved everything about it, but it wasn't in my price range, so I'm not going to keep it. And so we collect all of that feedback, too. Just out of curiosity, personally, um, what proportion of people actually send stuff back with feedback? I mean, I guess obviously a natural bias not to send stuff back. I'm just curious mm -hmm. how you sort of account for that, I guess. Yeah, so that checkout feedback uh, we get from an extraordinarily high amount of clients, actually. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, really high quality data. Okay, great. And uh, any other questions? Okay, awesome. I think we'll end it there then. Thanks very much. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you.